I want to thank you all at home watching. The, being virtual, it's not what we planned, but like Robert Burns said, the best laid plans of mice and men go off to rye. So thank you for bearing with us as we try to navigate COVID continually. It's a never-ending thing that seems to haunt us. But thank you for that. Week by week, we'll just do what we feel like we need to do and yet figure out how to continue to worship and love one another and all, all of that. So thank you for bearing with us as we navigate this thing. I wonder um, if I might uh, get you all to do a bit of an exercise with me this morning uh, at the risk of using a few things in the service. Uh, I brought a few um, props. That's terrible props, but here we go. Uh, and so I want some participation. So the, the few of you that are here can participate in this, and then all of you who are at home on the live stream can do this as well. I want you to take a look at this. I had it hidden behind this stack of Bibles. Can you tell what it is at home, I hope? Can you all tell what this is? What is this? It's a cup. What does it make you think of? Communion, right? That's, that's perfect. This was, a, this was actually a gift from a church that I served uh, a number of years ago as a parting gift, which was, uh, they gave me this communion set, which I thought was really wonderful. Uh, it's one of my favorite things to do as a pastor is the Lord's table. I love, uh, I love getting to do that. It's a real privilege, an honor to do that. Uh, but this cup, so when you see this cup, when you, what do you think of when you think of the Lord's table? What goes through your, your head? Like, what, what does it mean, this cup? Like, as you even approach the table, as we do the table, as this, the cup itself, it, it probably has some sort of um, something, some images, some concepts, some memories, all those things sort of wash around the cup, mostly from the experience that we have in church, right? We see a cup like this, and our immediate thing is the Lord's table, right? What about, um, what about this? I, I moved this over. I need to stay close to the mic, but I moved this over a little while ago. I promise I'll move it back. Uh, it's beautiful, though, isn't it? Um, this, what is it? What's it for? When you, baptism, right? So when you see this, you immediately think, oh, it's, it's uh, definitely a Presbyterian church, right? <laughs> right? Uh, but it's beautiful. I've sat over there the last few weeks and just really, I, I just think it's lovely. The lines on it, the carving, uh, it's just a beautiful uh, part of worship, part of the, everything a part of this, this worship area, right? I think it's lovely. So when you think of baptism, what do, what do you think of? Like when you hear that word, baptism, you think of your own baptism, do you think of uh, little children and their parents and maybe grandparents and uh, standing here on a Sunday and the waters uh, pouring off of that child? That sort of beautiful moment when the waters of baptism signify the sign and seal of God's covenant of grace and something powerful is happening through these waters as they mark a child into the, the life of the church and or even... Uh, something that's equally as important and precious is when a, uh, someone who has come to faith in Jesus as a, as a new believer and they, they come into the church wanting to be baptized and they're marked by these waters. It's a powerful thing. So when we hear those words and we hear the word cup in the context of church and we hear the idea of baptism, we, we, have, these, um, we have this frame of mind, these images that immediately sort of click into place. Our, our experience um, and uh, often sort of defines our immediate response to those words, the images that, that it brings about, sort of the powerful connection between experience and our concepts and how they're generally formed. I, I bring that up because we're about to hear from a text in Mark chapter 10 as we return to the study of the Gospel of Mark where Jesus uses the words cup and baptism in a way that actually broadens or deepens our perspective on cup and baptism. 
And it's important that we hear what Jesus has to say, because if we do, if we hear what Jesus has to say, there's a better than average chance that when we come to this table again and partake of the cup, or we see someone baptized, our understanding of what Jesus actually did in order to ensure the table and ensure this baptism and inform it will be deepened. But not only that, it may deepen our understanding of what it means to serve the Lord as we focus on what matters. And what matters is the progress of the gospel in my life and through my life, and the process of the gospel in your life and through your life. As we hear this image of cup and baptism, I want to uh, invite you into that. So let me read from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 to 45, and let's listen for that. Let me pause for a moment. Might be a little awkward on live stream, but let me pause for a moment so that um, maybe we can quiet our heart enough so that we might have ears to hear that the Holy Spirit may speak through God's word to us. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am to be baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant. But it's for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever will be great among you must be your servant, and whoever will be first among you must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray. Lord, I ask that um, you be with us as we look into your word, that whatever it is that you want to do in our lives, you would do. Father, I pray that nothing that I would say or do or leave unsaid or undone would hinder the work of your spirit. Lord, help us to see Jesus in this text. Lord, send your Holy Spirit to do the work within us, to transform us, to help us to become more like him so that we can see the gospel progress in our lives. I ask this in the powerful and the awesome and the marvelous name of Jesus. Amen. So our text, Mark 10, 34 to 30, sorry, 35 to 45. It opens on this ongoing scene. It, it, verse 35 picks up right after this powerful, pivotal moment when Jesus, along with his disciples, are, they're about to enter into Jerusalem. So they're on this road to Jerusalem. And as they go, this is the third time in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus begins to unpack for them what they can expect and what is going to happen to him as he is on this pathway, this messianic mission. And he tells them that it's going to be pretty rough. The cross looms large all through the Gospels. Mark is often referred to as this... um, this, uh, passion narrative with a long introduction. All the Gospels are really that, that case because the, because the cross is sort of hangs out there and interspersed within this story, Jesus comes back to it. He, he sort of points out to the disciples in the future, this is going to happen. These things are going to happen. He's going to deal with uh, suffering and pain and humiliation and the cross and death and resurrection. But, you know, they're kind of thick really, these disciples. Um, and I, 
I appreciate that because I can be pretty thick-headed sometimes too. I have my own ideas how things are supposed to work out and God should just play along with my plan. But the, the disciples um, do this over and over again. Even though Jesus multiple times sort of speaks into this and tries to tell them what's about to happen. And so in Mark chapter 10, verse 32 to 34, Jesus gives the really explicit idea of what's going to happen. He tells them, as they were on their way to Jerusalem, he said, See, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. I don't know how you could miss that, right? That's pretty clear. It's a pretty serious thing to say. You can imagine that that would be, that would be a party stopper, right? You know, like the conversation has just completely shifted. Something deep is going on. And on the hills of that, our text begins. For some reason, this seemed like the right moment for James and John to have this conversation with Jesus, right? It's, it's in this moment. Now, uh, this, this event is also talked about in Matthew's gospel. And in Matthew's gospel, he brings up the fact that their mother was there. And I'm really embarrassed for James and, and John at this moment if their mother was part of this whole thing. Like, I would be embarrassed. I'm embarrassed for them. That, you know, that, that rather than, but at least uh, Mark gives them that, that sense of their own agency, that they're doing this on their own. Jesus has just told them what they can expect. And yet somehow in that moment, these guys come up to Jesus with this question. And they went to him and they asked him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. Now think about that just for a moment. Isn't that something, I, I know that's something I do, right? God, uh, I know you might have this other plan, but this is what I want you to do for me. I mean, that's what's happening in this moment with James and John. There's, this is arrogant, right? As they're going to, the, to Jesus and they're telling Jesus, we want you just to do what we want you to do for us. Why can't you just do that? Like a genie in a bottle. That's the first thing they do. And then Jesus plays along and says, well, what is it that you want me to do for you? And so they ask him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Man. They're asking for places of prominence and authority and power in Jesus' glory, his glory, his kingdom. They're... Um, they're, they're talking about um, court, you know, courts and thrones while Jesus is talking about sacrifice and service and his own death and his resurrection. And that question that, they, that they're asking, when the, when the other disciples hear about it, it creates a stir, as it should, right? I mean, Mark tells us in verse 41 that when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. I'm, I'm calling those guys the indignant ten now. Right? I love that word, indignant. I, I love that the, that, the Mar, that the Greek word that, that Mark uses and even our translators that they use that word indignant. That's a great word to really convey the sense of what's happening. It's better than oh, they were angry, they were frustrated. No, they were indignant. That's a, that's a powerful image. And it really conveys what's actually happened because in, to be indignant basically means is I don't think this is fair. Right? This isn't like you know, righteous indignation. This is, I don't think this is fair because I didn't think of it first. I mean, there's a sense of the other 10, their pride, maybe their ego is involved in this. They're not, they're not guiltless in this moment. They don't want maybe James and John to be over them. Maybe they themselves want the opportunity to be on the right or left hand of Jesus. Why do these guys get this role? Why don't I get it? What makes them special? So there's this sense of a push and pull. There's there's ego involved. It doesn't, it doesn't bode well for any of them. And remember, um, one of the things I think is really funny about this is to remember that we were fairly confident, pretty confident, that Peter was the source for Mark's gospel, like he's telling the story, which means he's one of the indignant ten. Truth is, I think they all seem to miss the point. We have this great juxtaposition in this moment. Jesus laying out for them this language of sacrifice and suffering. And all they can do is come up and talk about 
positions of prominence and power and authority in Christ's glory. And all the while that the, the ten, the indignant ten are stewing and James and John are hoping for this place of prominence, Jesus does what he does best. I, I love this thing that Jesus does. He, he asks this piercing question. He makes this statement and then he asks this piercing question that has so many levels to it, so, so much imagery to it that speaks deeply into what it means to follow him. He says to them in verse 38, look guys, you, you, don't, you don't know what you're asking. You don't, you don't know what you're really talking about. And then he asks them this question. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I'm baptized? And those guys said, we are able. The right answer is no. But like us, right, when we see this cup, we have this notion of what this cup means. When we see baptism, we have a notion of what baptism it is. And yet, the way that God is working here, there's a deeper thing going on that's even associated with the cup that we drink and the waters of baptism that we place on the heads of our infants and on new believers. There's something deeper at foot here. I think maybe James and John had a fuzzy understanding of what Jesus meant based on their own experiences, but they should have known. They should have picked up on what Jesus was talking about with the cup itself. Because the cup in the Old Testament is usually about suffering and punishment. It's usually suffering and punishment at God's hand for the unrighteous. It's an image all through the Old Testament, this image of this cup. It's in, it's in the, the book of Psalms. It's in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Lamentation and Ezekiel where this image of the cup of God's wrath is present. There's this understanding of this total ruin which the cup represents and it's willed by God and constitutes this sense of divine judgment. The cup is this designation of judgment. And Jesus boldly applies this cup to himself. The image of the cup was used by the prophets to threaten the enemies of God with divine vengeance. And sinful humanity justly deserving God's wrath and displeasure. And this is all poured into this cup that's then poured out. And so Jesus is asking his disciples, can you drink of this cup? No. No. And baptism, well, for James and John, they may have been thinking about John, John's baptism or even Jesus' baptisms with John the Baptist himself. They may have associated baptism with this idea among the Jews at the time that baptism was a token of God's renewal of his people. Maybe that's what they were thinking. But the image of baptism, the way Jesus is using it here, is parallel to the cup in many ways. In popular Greek usage at the time, the vocabulary of baptism was used to speak of being overwhelmed by disaster or danger. And Jesus understood that his baptism was this expressed solidarity with sinful humanity, which signifies his willingness to assume the burden of God's judgment that was being meted out upon the cross. The cup in the baptism that Jesus mentions isn't like this cup or this baptism. It's crucial then to recognize that these images don't bear the same significance when applied to Jesus than they are applied to us. Because to share in someone's cup was to share their fate. And the disciples weren't going to share in Jesus' fate. And what they were going to share in was what Jesus has accomplished by drinking of the cup and the baptism on the cross that's what Jesus meant when he said in verse, the next verse down, that the cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism which I am baptized, you will be baptized. It's that connection with this cup and this baptism that we have because Christ took of the cup of the wrath of God and the baptism, the danger, the destructiveness, the judgment, the suffering, and death on the cross. Now, the right answer was, we can't drink of this cup. It's a cup that's only reserved for the Lord Jesus. Christ drank from the dregs of the cup of wrath and bathed in the judgment that was poured out like a baptismal font. 
submerged in it, in his death and his resurrection. They will not share in his fate. They can't. Only Christ can drink of that cup and endure the baptism associated with the cross. And that's the pathway to Christ's glory, and it's Christ's glory alone. I don't want to rush past this image of the cup and the baptism too quickly. Because this is in this moment when Jesus is giving us this image of the cup and baptism that goes deep into what it will mean then for us to understand what it means for us, to, for the gospel to progress in our lives and through our lives. Because it's out of this image that we see this great juxtaposition of Christ coming to the world to redeem sinful humanity in order to rescue, restore, and to save. And at the same moment, what we see in the lives of Jesus' disciples is some of the same things we see in ourselves. It's the sense of selfishness or this blatant self-centeredness, this jockeying for place of power and authority, this often telling God what we want him to do rather than being submissive to what he wants us to do, this misguided sense of self-importance and associated with courts and thrones and power. But this image of the cup and baptism are the images of which Jesus operates, this image of the symbol of Christ's suffering on our behalf. And then out of that, he's calling us to live in a particular way. The symbols of the cup and baptism reminds us of his cries in the garden of Gethsemane. Take this cup for me, but not my will, but yours. It symbolized the searing blow on his body from the hands of sinful men when they spit on him and mock him and hurl all kinds of insults at him and strike him. The cup and baptism symbolize that moment on the cross when he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Later when he says, Father, forgive them, and it is finished. James, nor John, nor anyone else could drink of that cup. It was only for Christ to do. And so that image shouldn't leave our minds too quickly, especially as we are able to sip from the cup at the table or feel the waters of baptism roll down our faces. We shouldn't rush past this image of the cup and baptism that Jesus gives us. Because this, the cup and the baptism actually help us in regards to understanding what it means to focus on what's the most important thing. And the most important thing, of course, for any believer is what matters is the progress of the gospel in our lives and through our lives. That's the main focus. And that's what happens with this, the image of this cup and baptism, as, as Jesus himself, out of that image, then begins to talk to his disciples about what it really will mean for them to step into the world and interact with one another and interact with the world around it because it pushes back on the images and the systems of the world around them. He explains to them in no uncertain term, out of this image of the cup and baptism, he explains to them that the economy of God's kingdom is not based on power or control, but on service and on giving, even giving up our lives for the sake of others. Jesus said to his disciples, you know that those who were considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus is telling his disciples, these these folks who actually lived in a culture that had servants. They understood all that that meant. They lived in a slave culture. They lived in a culture that understood ransom, what that meant. We have an academic understanding of servanthood and slavery and perhaps ransom. But these men would have known exactly what that would have meant. And what Jesus was calling them to out of this image of the cup and baptism that he would endure. He's calling his people to this understanding of what it actually means to put the gospel forward and to do it as the primary call. One theologian said, at no place did the ethics of the kingdom of God clash more vigorously with the ethics of the world than the matters of power and service. The ideas that Jesus represents regarding rule and service are combined in a way that finds no obvious precedent in either the Old Testament or Jewish tradition. Jesus speaks of service rather than greatness, power, prestige, and authority. 
What Jesus teaches about service and self-sacrifice is not, all, not simply a principle of the kingdom of God, but a pattern of Christ's own life that is authoritative for and transferable to disciples. Jesus is talking to his disciples out of this image of the cup and baptism, which will reference to the way that he would pour out his life as a ransom for many. He's telling his disciples of what it's required to follow him, and it's costly. It's counterintuitive to the world around us. There is a cost to it. But then Christ didn't come to be served, but then to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. It's out of this image of the cup and baptism that we have this understanding of giving our lives as a ransom for many as well, to serve and give our lives for the progress of the gospel in our lives and through our lives. It's out of this image of this cup and baptism that Jesus endured on our behalf. It's humbling, especially when we think of of James and John try to put themselves forward into the seat of authority and power rather than in this place of humility because of what Christ has done. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, humbling himself, giving his life as a ransom. I think that this moment with James and John and the indignant ten is a defining moment for them. And it's also a defining moment for us, hopefully. For it's this moment that we're made aware of the depths of the cup that Christ drank of. And yet... Some nights later, he gave the cup to his disciples. A cup of the new covenant shed in his blood for the forgiveness of sins. And this image of baptism that marks us but with God's covenant of grace. The depths of what Jesus means here and this calling of what it means to then serve him out of that understanding. And so the next time we come to this table and we drink of the cup or we watch someone as they're marked by the waters of baptism. I hope the image of the cup of Christ and Christ's baptism will take on this deeper meaning as it calls us to think of our lives as a ransom in order to advance the gospel. Let me pray and ask the Lord to help us. Come Holy Spirit and help us. Help us to be markedly different than the world around us as we seek to serve, even if it means um, humility, humbling ourselves. Help us to to do this in order to keep the, the purpose of our lives clearly in focus, this idea of advancing the gospel. Lord Jesus, thank you for this reminder of your cup and the baptism. Thank you for your blessing to us. We lift all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.